insect science contributes to understanding human immunity. Jules Hoffmann, Université de Strasbourg, France. On the 9th of November 1989, I was at the Institute in Strasbourg. I was very surprised and very hopeful for a positive future. But let me explain to you why we did this. So the point I want to make in this slide is that uh, we have information, we have had information for a long time about life expectancy in humans from the Paleolithic period on up to uh, recent times. And as you will see, the values around have uh, kept for many, many years, have kept around uh, half of life expectancy was here uh, 20, 20 years of age. And then all of a sudden something happened in about in the last 150 years, and you see that we have gone, this is a figure for the Young Kingdom, we have gone up to something which is close between 70, half life expectancy, uh, close to 80 years now. So what happened in those 150 years? It is not a um, selective, natural selection of genes over the millineries, which would be extremely helpful to fight infection. It was three aspects of biomedical sciences. One was hygiene, which appeared really in the middle of the 19th century, and then it was vaccination around uh, between the 19th and the 20th century, and finally was the development of antibiotics. Now, in all three aspects, we are in a relatively uh, difficult situation now. We all know that vaccination has a lot of problems, but the biggest problem of vaccination is that we, cannot, uh, we still ha don't have vaccines against uh, large diseases like HIV, like malaria, also like many diseases of streptococci, staphylococci, and so on. We have other uh, vaccines which do not cover fully uh, the uh, diseases for which uh, we treat uh, the people, we immunize the people. And then on the other hand, as we all know in the audience, we have had a lot uh, about this this morning already, there's uh, resistance coming up in bacterial strains, and there are now bacterial strains which are, which are multi-resistant to most of the antibiotics which are present. So we are at present in a situation which is extremely dangerous for the future. We may lack uh, means to fight the invasions of uh, uh, the next decades, and what we badly need in the community is a better understanding of three points. Number one, how are the microorganisms recognized by our body? Number two, how does this recognition translate into the production of effector substances? And then third point, of course, what are the effector mechanisms? Now, you cannot do all this, of course, in, uh, in humans, for many, many reasons, and uh, several laboratories in the world are working on model organisms, and I would like to show, to illustrate, what we have done in uh, Strasbourg, and uh, this uh, first reason, of course, first question, why did we work on insects? Let me just point out to you that insects account for 80% of all living species on Earth today. They annually destroy one-third of human crops, and they put one-third of humanity at uh, high risk of, uh, via the vector, ca vector capability capacities, excuse me, uh, of uh, bacteria, fungi, and so on, and parasitic infections. And what we knew when we started this some 50 years ago, when we started in the laboratory this work, we knew that insects were very highly resistant to infections. But the mechanisms were not known. So what we then did over the last years was to go through the analysis, and this is work which has been done over the last 20 years in Drosophila. Here, when you prick a fly, you see, uh, with bacteria, you see that there's antimicrobial activity appearing in the blood of this fly. There's nothing in controls. So we asked three questions. Number one, what are the effector molecules explaining this uh, antimicrobial activity in the blood? Number two, how are the genes controlling uh, the expression of these peptides? How are, they, uh, how are the genes uh, how are these genes controlled? And number three, um, what are the receptors which tell the insects that there's an infection going on? I'll be short uh, on the answers to uh, some of the answers to this, and uh, it took us many years to find that uh, the insect, in response to an infection, produces in its fat body cells which is the equivalent of the mammalian liver, seven, th seven families of uh, potent antimicrobial peptides. The names are not relevant to us here. They are secreted into the hemolymph and they oppose the invading organisms. So these are novel antibiotics, and uh, uh, they are, interestingly, it was shown uh, that they are also produced by humans, 
And uh, one interesting point is that some of these, like drosomycin, defense and so on, are similar between humans and uh, flies. Now, uh, the next question then is, how are, is the expression of the genes and coding of these peptides controlled? And here again, it was a matter of uh, several years before we came to understand that there are two, uh, regular, two mechanisms regulating the expression. One shown here is referred to as the toll pathway because it had initially been identified by Nüstlein Vollert and Erich Fischhaus in Germany as involved in the dorsal ventral patterning system. Now, we could show that this is also involved later in development in the production of antifungal substances and then some antibacterial substances. A second pathway shown here, which we called IMD pathway, which is very similar to the mammalian tumor necrosis factor receptor pathway. Now, when we went to, uh, to look at mutant flies, mutant for toll, for instance, or for the MD, we had very uh, remarkable uh, phenotypes, and I'll just show the one for toll. Uh, this is a fly which has been infected by Aspergillus. This was done in the laboratory by Bruno Lemaitre, Jean-Marc Reichardt. And uh, you see this fly has been overgrown by hyphae of the fungus. It has no defection. This is a toll deficient fly. It has no uh, response, no uh, way of fighting the infection. So this result uh, was really uh, drew a lot of attention in the community, and let me explain to you shortly why. Number one, it was known, of course, at that time that we humans have two uh, defense systems. One is what we refer to as innate immunity. It's an immediate reaction, blocks growth and uh, dissemination of microbes, has no memory. And the second one, which is called adaptive immunity, and this uh, follows innate immunity the, with a delay of several days. It appeared later in development, only in vertebrates. It's absent from uh, the invertebrates. It's a large repertoire of receptors we know about the immunoglobulins and uh, the antibodies and so on. It has memory cells, which consequently allows vaccination. Now, there was, in the, there was a wall in the mid-90s, and that was the, the one that it was perceived that adaptive immunity, illustrated here by lymphocyte, uh, needed a boost from uh, the uh, innate immunity. This is a prototypical innate immune cell. It's called the dendritic cell, on which Ralph Steinman, who was a colloriate, uh, has worked for many years. And so it was assumed that microbial cell fragments would interact with an unknown receptor and then hence uh, act on activation of the adaptive immune, uh, immunity, which would allow for antibody production and for memory, and also would act on the activation of innate immunity. Now, this receptor then uh, was unknown, and this is after the publication of our study, uh, Charlie Janeway, with whom we collaborated at that time, uh, found that there was a human homologue uh, that was in um, 97, and one year later, the, uh, Bruce Beutler, with a different approach, also found that uh, toll like receptors, the way they're uh, referred to now, a toll like receptor. And uh, so from then on, that was in the late uh, 90s, uh, really, as we say, as we like to say in this audience, a wall was broken and it appeared rapidly that there were, we humans produced 12 toll receptors, or toll like receptors, as they're called in the immune system. And uh, they recognized various types of uh, micro. Uh, we are here on the um, cytoplasmic membrane, so this would be outside of the cell. And they recognized various uh, determinants of uh, walls from uh, microbes or in the endosome. This is not relevant to presentation today. So in response to that, uh, they activate NF-kappa B, which is a central activating system, central transactivator of all immune responses, both in flies and in humans. And as a result, we have activation of the active immune system and production of antimicrobial peptides. Now, uh, this is Shizu Akira, who has to be credited for finding, for identifying most of the interacting molecules with the toll-like receptors. Now, what we have learned since, uh, there has, so what I mentioned, the first data on toll receptors in the fly were published um, 15 years ago. Ever since, about 20,000 papers appeared on the role of toll-like receptors in mammals, particularly in clinical settings. And we can summarize now that uh, uh, toll-like receptors in mammals play an immense role in inflammation, a central role in inflammation, not the only role, but a central role, also in uh, fighting infectious diseases. They also play a role in uh, adjuvancy for vaccination, in autoimmunity, in allergy, and immunotherapy, including 
cancer immunotherapy, and also in the nervous system, as we'll hear in a later presentation by Michal Schwartz. Now, uh, let me then go a step further and say, so I had made, have made the point that in this innate immune response, uh, we have uh, the effect of molecules essentially antimicrobial peptides, not only, but essentially antimicrobial peptides. We have understood now the mechanisms of recognition. Now, what is between recognition of the uh, invading pathogen and uh, the effect of mechanism? There's an intracytoplasmic signaling cascade, which was unknown, of course, when this start, study started. And I'm comparing here what we have learned of the tall pathway of the fly, which defends uh, against fungi, and the IMD pathway against gram-negative bacterial infection. This is a very simplified uh, scheme, like my whole presentation. I mean, we have 15 minutes. I mean, it's, I'm forced to oversimplify. I just ask you to believe me what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is uh, toll-like receptors. This is, of course, those, uh, those data come from the mammalian community. Toll-like receptors in mammals and uh, TNF receptor pathway in mammals. And the only point which I want to make in this slide as I'm not going to the names of all this, it's going to take us too long, it is when you look at the receptors and you look at the same colors for the uh, daptone proteins, for the kinases, for the, uh, these complexes which will activate RF-kappa B, you are struck by this totally unexpected similarity bet uh, between what is going on in the fly and what is going on in humans. And so this is really, this was, this was really for our community a break, breaking a wall of, uh, because all that was uh, not perceived. And this asks them the question, so when did this appear? When did this innate immune uh, uh, defense appear? And uh, so through data mining, of course, we know now uh, the genomes of uh, up to 5,000 species around. These are the invertebrates. They make up 95% of all species on Earth now. The vertebrates are here. They make up 5%. Now, 95% have only innate immunity, the one which I've described to you. And vertebrates also have innate immunity, but in addition, adaptive immunity, which appeared around 450 million years ago in the early fishes. So what we now can say is that innate immunity, with all the molecules which I've shown and not had the time to name to you, all this has appeared one billion years ago. And it has nearly not changed in one billion years. It has remained the essential first-line defense against uh, infections. And the big change arrived, uh, appeared at this stage when adaptive immunity uh, appeared. But without adaptive immunity, obviously, 95% of all the species on Earth can survive. And in my last slide, uh, I would just uh, want to put out then, uh, what we see here is that we have innate immunity uh, is a toolkit which is present in the first multicellular organisms, and both for the receptors, remember there were three walls we wanted to break, the receptors, the signaling activation pathways, and the effector genes. And as far as we now can tell from all what we have learned, uh, those the examples that in all three groups, these molecules are present. They are present, as I've shown in the previous slide, uh, in sea anemones, they're present in worms, in crustaceans, and so on. So, uh, with that, the take-home message would be that we all have, we all uh, have 49 seconds left, we all uh, have a very powerful innate immune response, which is the one which when we, we get a scratch or we shave badly, uh, which is protecting us immediately and which is absolutely mandatory. And then uh, within the hours following and then the days following, the adaptive immunity will uh, come to the fore and then will uh, tune, uh, fine tune uh, the defense and will allow for memory, which is the basis of vaccination. And as I pointed out, vaccination is still uh, really still a lot, uh, needs a lot of work in uh, the society because our vaccines are not uh, what we require for the next uh, decades. Okay, with that, I would like to thank you. And um, I don't take questions here, that's true. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>